Hi guys, tonight we're going to talk about Earth and Space. This is our flip lesson number two. You should have with you your Earth and Space handout from class, and as we move through the video, you can go ahead and fill it out. We're going to start with a little history of the models that have existed about the Earth-Sun relationship and go way back to the second century with a astronomer and philosopher known as Ptolemy. And you can see here a picture of Ptolemy on the left, and then we're going to move on to Copernicus and Galileo who came up with a secondary model. But let's go ahead and start with Ptolemy's model. Ptolemy's model was known as the geocentric model, and if you guys look up into the sky during the day, it seems like the sun moves through the sky and that's exactly what Ptolemy thought. He thought that the sun rotated around the earth and that the earth, geo, was the center, centric, of the universe. So his geocentric model was believed for or was um, was withheld for many, many years. That's what was the the accepted model of our solar system. And it wasn't until about the 16th century that Copernicus uh, presented what is now known as the heliocentric model. And you can see the geocentric model on the right and the heliocentric model right here on the left. And Copernicus, based on some of his astronomical observations, said that he believed that the sun was the center of the solar system. Now at this time, this was not a widely accepted model of our solar system. And the one main reason was that biblical scripture actually said that the earth did not move. And Copernicus is now saying that the earth does move around the sun. So a lot of people didn't want to accept Copernicus's um, belief of the heliocentric model. Um, he published some papers, and not many people followed Copernicus, but later, as other scientists, and you'll see a picture here in a minute, right here, of Galileo, um, they started to support Copernicus's heliocentric model as well. And Galileo kind of was the one that ended up in the hot seat. And he ended up in the hot seat because he used um, his telescope and was able to support the Copernican model, uh, the heliocentric model, with a lot more data, and he was starting to get he was starting to get a lot more attention um, back in the 16th century. And in 1615, he was he was brought to the Inquisition court, and this was a court that was held in the Vatican where they would try people that they believed um, were trying to hurt the church, and they thought that. Galileo's model was going against the church, and he was actually found guilty. And they gave him an option. They said, Galileo, if you want to live, you have to recant your beliefs, and then you're going to spend the rest of your life on house arrest. And that's what Galileo did. I guess he decided that life was better than death, and he spent the next 10 years in his house, and he was known never to speak about heliocentricity again. He did a lot of other things um, when he was in his house and developed a lot of other theories, but nothing having to do with the way that the earth moves. But right before he died, um, um, Galileo was known to shout out Iper si mueve as his last words before death, and Iper si mueve means, and yet it moves, and he was discussing the movement of the earth around the sun, and slowly over the next couple centuries, more and more people began to accept the heliocentric model. Um, shortly after Galileo, another scientist came along and started to, um, started to work on this idea that the earth revolves around the sun and looked into how it revolves around the sun. And this scientist's name was Johannes Kepler. He worked together with a Danish astronomer known as Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe was probably one of the most well-known astronomers of his time. He was a Danish man of considerable wealth, and he basically spent all of his money and a lot of money of the Danish government just to study the motion of the planets. And he collected all of his observations in hundreds and hundreds of journals. And Kepler and Brahe began to work together in 1600, but it was only a year that they were able to work together before Tycho Brahe died suddenly. Um, and there's some controversy over his death, whether or not he was poisoned. Some people think Kepler did it, but a lot of people think that there was no reason for Kepler to want to do that. Um, but after Tycho Brahe died, his family wanted to sell all of his journals filled with his observations, um, and they mysteriously disappeared. And it was later found out that Kepler 
I don't think he was ever charged, so we'll say allegedly stole his life's work. Um, and he used these observations to help come up with his laws of planetary motion nine years later. And these are pretty famous laws, so let's learn a little bit about them. Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun as one foci. So a circle has one center, an ellipse has two. Um, the second center of the Earth's orbit around the sun is this, this gravitational center that's caused by all of the other planetary bodies in the solar system because they have matter, they have, um, you know, mass and they have gravitational pull. So it just changes the rotation from a circle to an ellipse. The second part of Kepler's law is that in their orbits around the sun, the planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. And all that this means is that when the Earth is closer to the Sun, since it's an ellipse, at some points it's going to be closer to the Sun than others, it moves a little bit faster. And when it's further from the Sun, it moves a little bit slower. But if you compare the areas of this right here to this over here, they're the same area. So sweep out equal areas in equal time. Now, because it's an ellipse, Sometimes the Earth is closer to the Sun than others, and when it's closest to the Sun, we call that perihelion. You can see, um, you can see a picture of it right here. Um, but perihelion is during January 2nd, so you think January, hmm, that's one of our coldest months. When it's furthest from the Sun, we're at what's called aphelion, and that's in July. So if when the Earth is closest to the Sun, it's January, that doesn't seem like that would indicate that would be the cause of our seasons. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what causes our seasons, why there are seasons. Um, before we can understand seasons, let's look at what creates time, and that's Earth's movements. So let's focus on how the Earth moves around the sun. Well, the first movement that Earth takes is its rotation. It rotates on its axis every 23 hours and 56 minutes, and we call that a side reel day. And here you can see a picture of somebody standing on the equator. And as the Earth spins, the part of the Earth that's in daylight is my day. The part of the Earth that's in shadow would be my night. Earth's revolution is when the Earth moves around the sun. And it takes 365 days in a touch more, as we talked about on leap year, um, to rotate around the Earth. And this is obviously how we measure out years. Now, if you guys look at the sun and we kind of think back to our geocentric model, that path that the sun takes through the sky is known as the ecliptic. And if you think of the solar system and our model of the solar system in two dimensions, you can imagine that all of the planets, including Earth, orbit around the sun on this ecliptic, on this one plane. So the ecliptic is the path that the sun appears to take through the sky. And that's going to change in winter to summer, and we'll get back to this in a little bit. Um, at night, if you look at that same path and you watch the constellations seemingly rise over the horizon and move through that, we call it the zodiac. So the constellations that fall on the ecliptic are called the zodiac. So let's get back to the question, why do we have seasons? It's not due to proximity to the sun during our orbit around the sun. It has to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis, and that's the most important thing here. Sometimes when we're tilted towards the Earth, the sun's light hits areas of the Earth more directly. So the main thing here with seasons has to do with the angle of the sunlight. So if you can imagine that this right here is your flashlight and you're shining a beam directly on a wall, it's going to concentrate all of that energy in this area right here. But instead of shining it directly, let's say you start to angle the sun's light a little bit, you can see how all of that light is now being stretched out over a greater area. And if you angle it even a little bit more and a little bit more, that solar illumination is not as strong because you're using the same amount of energy stretched over a greater area and even more. So seasons are affected by solar illumination. When you have direct sunlight, it's going to warm the earth greater than when that sunlight is indirect and it's hitting the earth at an angle because the area at which it hits is increasing. And you can see numbers here to support what I'm talking about. So as the earth rotates, uh, rotates the angle at which the sun's light hits the earth changes. So 
let's start talking about our seasons here. So in summer, June, it's warmer than in winter, December in our hemisphere because the sun's rays hit the earth at a more direct angle during the summer than the winter. So during the winter, we're tilted away from the sun so that sun's light is spreading over a larger area and then vice versa for summer. Um, and you can see a picture here for the winter. The sun's rays hit the earth at an extreme angle. This is when the days are are much shorter. And you can see here, if you fall on this latitude, the dark part right here is the nighttime. And there's just going to be a little bit of sun rising up over the horizon and then setting very, very quickly. So if you visit Alaska in the wintertime, you're not going to see the sun very much. On the flip side, if you visit Alaska in the summer, you're not, it's not going to be dark very much. Okay, let's talk about the equinox and the solstice. So the equinox is every fall and spring, and that's when the day and night are of equal length. And during the equinox, the sun is going to hit the equator, and it's going to hit the equator um, at a direct angle. So the sun's light is going to be directly over the equator during my equinox. Day and night are of equal length, and my seasons are fall and spring for this one. My solstices are every winter and summer, and this is when the sun appears to reach its southern and most and uh, southernmost and northernmost points. And this is going to be in June and December, my winter and my summer solstice. And during my um, winter solstice, the sun's light is going to be directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. That's December. And then during my summer solstice, it's going to be directly over the Tropic of Cancer, and that's in our northern hemisphere. So that would be in June. And the Tropic of Cancer runs right through Cuba. So we're, we're pretty close to it if you go down south a little bit. And again, here you see all of the different seasons going from my winter to my uh, to spring to summer to fall. We move through solstice to equinox, solstice to equinox. So the earth seasons are not caused by the differences in the distance from the sun throughout the year. They are a result of the tilt of the earth's axis. I hope you guys learned a little something tonight and we'll review when I see you guys in class. Thanks for listening.